There is blind justice, and then there is trading justice, so that you can finally afford to get that laser eye surgery. Not only will people find you more attractive once you ditch those old glasses, you'll be able to see your charts better. That's what we call win-win. Speaking of winning, it's time for a little trading justice. Brought to you by TackleTrading.com. Welcome out to the Trading Justice Podcast presented by Tackle Trading. If you're interested in learning how to invest, protect your mutual funds, protect your retirement account, or just need to make a little bit of more money on a uh, weekly, daily, monthly, yearly basis, get over there to TackleTrading.com. Get in the game. Change lives one trade at a time. Now, trading justice here, Tim. Uh, we got a we got a cool guest here today, uh, and I, I got to be honest, Caleb. I didn't know a lot about you uh, before uh, last night when I started uh, when Phil sent over a little bit of your bio over. But we got Caleb Light from Power Practical. Uh, Caleb is the uh, one of the creators of uh, is it uh, what is it the Power Pot? Is that what it's called, Caleb? Yep. Yeah, it's called the Power Pot. It's called it's the Power a, Pot. Uh, camping cooking pot that. You make electricity anytime you heat it up with water inside. You know, you know, Tim. I, I, I have never seen anything like this in my life. And uh, Caleb, I, I'm, I'm from a central Utah area where we do a lot of camping. And I immediately started looking at this thing, going, "Oh my God, that is really, really, really cool." Mm-hmm. And then I went to, and Tim, you got to check this out. I went to uh, uh, the uh, uh, watched him uh, perform on Shark Tank because he was a he was a guest on Shark Tank. Uh, trying to find some seed money from the likes of Mark Cuban and others, right. and I'm sure we'll talk to Caleb about that. But it was it was really really cool. And, and Caleb, I got to just tell you, I want to hear all about it. But I thought you guys killed it on Shark Tank. I thought you guys owned it in every capacity. And you want to know what my favorite moment was? It was when Cuban offered twenty uh, twenty percent to uh, offer two hundred fifty thousand for twenty percent, and you came immediately back with nope twelve percent. We'll give you three percent options on the first go around. I thought <laughs> I thought that was a veteran investor move, and uh, great 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 work, Caleb. How are you doing today? Oh, fabulous! I appreciate you guys uh, letting me come on your podcast and stoked to chat with you. Yeah, we appreciate it. Now. Um, Caleb, uh, a little bit about yourself. Uh, what we know is that you are you studied accounting at Utah Valley University. Uh, you started Cupad back in '08, selling advertising to, you know, big companies like Overstock, Zag, uh, University, uh, you know, the University of Utah. But you created uh, you uh, joined Power Practical in 2011. Now, in terms of uh, let's let's go back to Cupad because. Our, our listeners, Caleb, they like to not only hear about your products and what you do, they like to hear about you, what kind of your story. Let's go back to 2008 and CupAd. What was CupAd, your first company in 2008? What did they do? Yeah, so uh, at the time I was living in Alaska doing construction with one of my little brothers. And uh, in Anchorage, there happens to be more coffee shops per capita than anywhere else in, in the U.S., even more so than Seattle. And what we noticed was, like, all these coffee shops were uh, distributing kind of the to-go coffee in plain white cups. And so we were like, well, why don't we just put some ads on it, have the advertiser pay for the cup, and then give the cups for free to the coffee shop. So it's kind of like a win-win because in the advertising world, there's all these different metrics that advertisers look at, and coffee cups happen to be a pretty good vehicle for uh, uh, for that. And then, you know, giving free cups to the coffee shop ended up saving them, like, you know, 15 grand a year on their bottom line, which, you know, when you're churning 80 to 100 to 150, that's like a pretty reasonable amount of money to, to be saving. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's kind of uh, where Cup at it uh, originated from. Cup at a very descriptive uh, name there. I like it. Now, uh, in terms of your, when you first had this idea for Cup at, uh, and you first presented it to your first potential buyer, uh, how did it go around? How did, how did, what was the response to it? Uh, so the very first one we did is uh, the construction company we were working for. We we it was my uncle's company, and so we just did like a really simple ad on a couple hundred cups, and then placed them within this coffee shop that we had a relationship with. And you know, over like 200 cups, he ended up getting three deals out of it. Um, and so we thought that was interesting. Um, and then we started, you know, going after larger companies and, you know, selling advertising, especially in kind of the 2008 circuit was uh, a bit difficult. A lot of people were feeling the kind of recession hit and we were kind of proposing a non-traditional channel, which, you know, took a little bit uh, more courage, if you will, for uh, a company to, to, to go out on that limb. But 
we were successful in securing some, you know, big accounts and, uh, you know, just took multiple conversations. Did, and, you, did, did you have and, anybody? Uh, we did. We ended up distributing around 60,000 awesome. cups. Okay. Did you have anybody balk at this idea of putting advertisement yeah. on, on a cu cup of coffee? Did anybody think it was a little weird or what was, uh, did anybody just say flat out that's no? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, in, in any kind of realm of sales, you always get the no, but it's just, in my opinion, it's just about persevering and plowing through those no's until you find the yeses because it's inevitable. If you have something that, if you're offering something of value, you know, and you're hustle hard enough, you'll figure out a way to make it I happen. like hard work there. Now, Caleb, coming, uh, fast forwarding here uh, back from Cup Ad, in 2011, three years later, you, you joined Power Practical, and, and that's what this uh, Power Pot uh, is, is a part of. Uh, but in terms of Power Practical, what was it about Power Practical that you, you just wanted to be a part of? Yeah, so um, I, I, per, I grew up in Montana. I'm a very avid outdoorsman, fisherman, hunter. I love spending time outside, and I met these two engineers that invented the power pot, and they were looking to kind of expand their team and launch their business, and um, it Cup Ed wasn't getting as much traction as, as I would like, and I had the opportunity to kind of work in the outdoor world, and uh, I thought, you know, a pot that made power would be something really interesting, not only to kind of the outdoor segment of people like me that go into the backcountry looking to keep their devices charged, but there's also, like, the potential to figure out a solution for, you know, the emerging markets or the people that live, like, in, within Africa, for example, that live off-grid but yet still have kind of uh, cell phones and other devices that they're looking to charge. And so I kind of saw, that was my you know, a cool thought. opportunity to play in a space and then something of a uh, large... Matt, that was my exact first sure. thought, and I'm glad you mentioned that. You know, I, I think it's really cool, the idea of a, a hunter going up in the woods, going elk hunting, and he can charge his iPhone and listen to, to his tunes or something, or a podcast, or the Trading Justice podcast, but even more powerful than that would would, would be the third justice. world. I mean, there are a lot of people in this world, and, and Matt, can you imagine? Power your cell phone with PowerPot, connect to the internet, and pay for stuff with Bitcoin. You know, that would be, it's an, I love it. I love it. See, see, see. That's that's the next business venture. We we got to get the power pot to Africa. We got to get Bitcoin in Africa. I'm all about it. I'm all about it. Um, but no, it, it was honestly when I was looking at this, that was my first thought process as well. Is you know, Tim, you and I were were born and raised in a very small community. Caleb, kind of like yourself, just uh, a bunch of avid hunters and fishermen and outdoorsmen and, you know, just, uh, you know, I, every single one of us at some point or another have been sitting around the campfire and the, and the phones went dead or, you know, whatever whatever it is. And it's like uh, this this idea, I've never really thought about it because I'm not, I'm not that type of guy. But when I saw this, I was like, why in the world hasn't this been thought of a million times before? This is an awesome, awesome idea, and there's obviously a marketplace for it, and uh, I think that's what you saw in 2011, but uh, you still needed funding, and uh, you guys decided to go on Shark Tank. When did you go on Shark Tank? Yeah, so um, we, to, to be totally honest, we actually closed a round of funding in January of 2013 with some local investors in the Salt Lake community. And then um, in the summer of 2013, we got uh, an email from one of the producers of Shark Tank ask, asking us to apply. Because kind of another interesting aspect of our business is we leverage a, a, um, a crowdfunding where, you know, when you come out with a new product, before you spend all the capital up front to produce it, open molds, et cetera, you can pre-sell it um, on platforms like Kickstarter or Indiegogo. And that's something that we leveraged from the beginning, and that's actually how we launched our company. That's how we got our first, quote, unquote, round of funding. You know, it's totally non-dilutive, which is cool. You collect cash on the front end, which is cool. And then you produce a product, you ship it, and life is good. Um, and so what, what we noticed was the, the Shark Tank producers go to those sorts of platforms and look for interesting products. And so they reached out to us, asked us to apply. We went through the rig and reward of, of the application process and we're selected to fly out to LA in the summer of uh, 2013 and that's when we actually filmed. Oh, awesome, mm. awesome. You know, it's, uh, you know, Tim, you and I aren't that familiar with Kickstarter and crowdfunding and, and things because we, we've never really done those. Uh, but I've heard of so many, you know, people like Caleb and other people like that that are, you know, Phil. these small businesses. That, yeah, Phil's done this multiple uh -huh. different times. 
um, that are, you know, just an individual small business that, you know, goes out to places like crowdfunding and, and Kickstarter and other other successful marketing things like that to generate money to to push their business. You know, historically, Caleb, and, and this is kind of where we come in. We're investors, and we understand, uh, you know, credit and debt and all that stuff. Uh, but uh, in terms of, the, you know, the small business individual, they have such a hard time getting access to the monies that they need to push great ideas like yours. And that's where Kickstarter and, and crowdfunding and can step in. And then, you know, amazingly, the, uh, it eventually leads you to going on Shark Tank. Now, I want to talk about your Shark Tank experience because we've all seen Shark Tank. Well, let, me, let, me ask, let me ask Caleb Where's a quick he? question, though. Caleb, what were you more nervous doing, uh, going on Shark Tank or taking our phone call today? Uh, I was honestly more <laughs> nervous to pitch the producers of Shark Tank than anything. <laughs> I was like so shaking in my pre pitch, and then once we got in there, I was good. Got out the got out that's the. That's the wrong answer, Caleb. That's, that's the wrong answer. You're, you're listening I was to the trade. More scared Joseph's to take podcast. the phone call. <laughs> there you go. There you go. We're uh, we're hard ass like that, Caleb. No, uh, you know yeah. it's uh, nice. Tim is always good to drop a nonsensical question like that and get me off point. Uh, that's what that's that's what he does. He's like the gesture. Of the Trading Justice podcast, and yes, thanks. A sniper. <laughs> a sniper, yes. You would like to think of yourself as a sniper. I'm sitting there picturing you dressed as a gesture right now, but you know, it's all good. It's all good. Um, so, Caleb, uh, coming back to Shark Tank. So, you come on Shark Tank, and there is literally, what is there? There's five oh. potential investors there. And the first, one, of, one of the first questions I saw asked, I can't remember the, yep. the guy's name. He was a guy sitting in the middle, and he said, he said, I thought this was funny and stupid at the same time. Horrible question in my estimation. Oh, it wasn't even a question. It was more like a comment. He looks at it. He holds it, and he says, I can't even hook, cook a hot yep. dog in this thing. And I'm thinking to myself, you've never been camping. Not yeah. once in yeah. your life have you ever been camping. <laughs> Oh my yeah. god. What was your what was your response to that comment that you could yeah. cook a hot dog in there? So that that was actually yeah, yeah that was actually Kevin O'Leary. Um, and my response to that question was the size of the pot that the power pot is in, it's like a one point two quart pot, uh, is the most commonly purchased pot in the outdoor industry and he was just like yep. okay, got put, it. Uh, listen to that no more. Okay, put Kevin O'Leary <laughs> in his place. You can't even cook a hot dog in this and and Gibbs like, well, that is the most common uh, thing, the common you know thing sold in the industry. All right, you put me in the place. I'm an asshole. Continue on. Um, but then that hey, that's somebody going in there prepared. Oh yeah, oh yeah, I love it. I love it. Preparation plus yeah. execution equals success, Caleb. Um, so in terms of that is the formula, right there. That's what we live by here at Trading Justice. So in terms of Mark Cuban, though. Mark Cuban is probably the most well-known investor on Shark Tank. Um, he's a very charismatic individual, an amazing, amazing investor in, in, in his own right. Uh, you know, knowing a little bit about Mark Cuban's story, you know, created, uh, what was it, Broadcom uh, back in the 1990s, sold it to Yahoo, uh -huh. uh, you know, uh, protected his entire investment with protective put options. Uh, wonderful, wonderful guy and investor. Um, but uh, when Mark Human started negotiating with you, what was what was the emotion like of this amazing investor, um, a a genius in his own right? What was your emotion at the time when he started negotiating a percentage of you? So, um, like I said, we had closed a round of funding from some local investors about six months prior to, to actually going and pitching the sharks, and. Um, our company was in a really good place in terms of cash we had on hand, inventory we had on hand, new doors that we were opening in terms of distribution. And so when he came back with that offer of like 20%, I was just like, there's no way we can do that because we can't do a down round. Um, we can't, you know, there's no reason we need to penalize our other investors because we're not in that place, you know. And so that that's, you know, made it hard because I really wanted to close the deal. There had been conversations that they didn't show on there um, about some of the benefits of working with Mark. Um, in terms of like keto you know, financing and things like that, that you know helps kind of within the growth stages. Um, and so I really, really wanted to figure out a way to make it happen. And at one point, he actually said he was out. 
um, which they didn't air it, and I, I pulled them back in, you know, with the whole, well, what if we brought up some options, you know, try to sweeten the deal for you, and uh, ultimately that's what we ended up nailing down with them. So we accomplished the, you know, getting the funding in a non-down round sort of fashion so that none of, you know, the common stockholders or the, the other preferred shareholders would would take um, any more dilution than they needed to based on just raising more money and yet sweeten the deal enough for Mark to come on board and, you know, enable us to leverage um, all the sort of resources when, uh, that come with them. When, when, what, one of the standard ways an investor will basically sweeten the pot for themselves is trying to devalue your market valuations. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a very standard negotiating te uh, mm -hmm. technique where they come in and, and you say that your company's valued at $2 million and they start just questioning that in, initially. Yep. You know, they, they want to invest, but they want to get the best deal possible for themselves. And so I thought that was, uh, was uh, kind of cool to see kind of how all that worked out. But also, before you even went on to Shark Tank, obviously your other investors that you had already secured funding from uh, to a large extent, did you have to talk to them about even getting approval to go on Shark Tank to bring on other investors? Yeah, like I mean, we have a board of, of uh, directors, and, you know, that was a decision at the board level that was made that, you know, we felt like it was a good opportunity for, you know, to potentially bring on another investor and, you know, the whole sort of PR aspect of getting on national television and in front of 8 million, like, million eyeballs were all sort of good outcomes. Um, and then the deal that was made, everyone was happy with. We closed, and we've been working with Mark for a couple of years now. That's awesome. You know, Caleb, I'll tell you right now, um, love the product. I, you know, first time I ever heard about the product was last night, and I immediately loved the product. I thought it was a, an ingenious product and well played, well done, getting the funding, doing everything you have. I think this is such a wonderful story, and why I'm so glad you came on the Trading Justice podcast is because we like to uh, we like to highlight number one wonderful people who are investors, who are creators, entrepreneurs, who are getting out there and they do whatever it takes to to find their success. And I'm sure there's, the, you know, if, if we actually dug into it, there's a lot of, you know, difficult moments in this journey, but you continue to push through, you got the funding, and then you went to Shark Tank, got more funding, and now you got this amazing product line that you're out pushing to. You know how many uh, how many countries worldwide do you sell the power pot in right now? Uh, we're in 14. 14 countries worldwide. Uh, Cabela's, REI, other major major retail stores, and it all started with just a simple idea that you needed funding from, and it's that you pushed it, got better, and now you have a product that you're selling in 14 different countries. Caleb, well done. Thank you. I got one last question. Awesome. No. <clears throat> What's your relationship with Mark Cuban like, Caleb? Uh, do you still talk to him every quarter at all? Like, uh, do you know him? I mean, do you have his cell cell phone number? If so, can I have it? Oh, <laughs> uh, it's like a weekly update to Mark. Um, but the cool thing about working with Mark and um, is that he has like ten or twelve full time employees that work under the Mark Cuban Company's um, banner. And their job is to make sure his investments are successful. And they're very specialized people, you know, from accounting to graphic design to business development to all sorts of different things. And so, you know, at, not only were we able to get funds from him, but, uh, you know, we have access to all those people and it doesn't cost us anything. And, you know, they're there just to help in any way they can and ensure that, you know, everything's moving in the right direction. And it's just overall been super awesome and, you know, I, one of the better experiences, definitely, of all our investors. Does he allow you to sit courtside uh, at Dallas Maverick games? They say I just got to show up to Dallas, and the tickets Dallas. are there. So I, I still have yet to take them you up on that it, offer. Caleb. Dallas is a wonderful city, one of my favorite in the entire U.S. I know. You'll love it. So we'll definitely bring you on next time. Uh, next time yeah. you get there, but the yeah, it's awesome. Cool. Caleb, Caleb Light, uh, everybody from uh, Power okay. Practical. Uh, he has the. Uh, a Product called the Power Pot for those of you who, you know, camp or are an outdoors type individual. This is an absolutely wonderful, must-needed product for you guys. And yes, you can cook a hot dog in it, and you can power your cell phone. It's awesome. <laughs> now, Caleb, how how can people get a hold of you? How can they uh, how can they buy the Power Pot? Um, probably the easiest way is just through our website. It's just powerpractical.com, um, and uh, or you can go to REI. Or Cabela's and uh, pick one up in store. 
Awesome, awesome, awesome. Keb Light, everybody. You've been listening to the Trading Justice Podcast presented by Tackle Trading. We'll be right back uh, with uh, Matt and Tim talking about uh, the Fed meeting coming up on Thursday, and uh, we'll be right back. For now, TackleTrading.com. Welcome back to the Trading Justice Podcast presented by Tackle Trading. As always, if you're looking for uh, some more information, some better advice, uh, or you just want to get out there and make some money, go over there, TackleTrading.com. Get in the game one trade, uh, one trade at a time. So, Tim, uh, just uh, recapping Caleb real quick. Impressive young man, wouldn't you say? You know, what a, what a story. I got to tell you, listening to that, engaging with him, he, he seems like he's got – some interesting life experiences, even though he does seem pretty young. Uh, I don't. I shouldn't even say that. I don't know how old he is. Actually. He is. He's pretty young. <laughs> so, he looks young. Uh, I will but, tell you uh, that. Yeah, Matt, you, you could kind of pick up on that. But I love the idea. And the first thing that I thought of was the third world. You know, I do like we talked about in the interview. It's not just about campers or hunters up in the mountains that can get their Wi-Fi, but, uh, you know, it's really, it could be, it could have some really good impacts around the globe. I, I love the interview, and I love the idea there, and uh, really cool young man, really impressive. Agreed, agreed. Um, you know, someone, uh, you know, that young starts a small business in, uh, you know, uh, what was it, 2008, goes, <coughs> goes out there, works hard, gets the job done, comes in, uh, joins, um, you know, uh, uh, power, uh, power practical in 2011. It's on Shark Tank by 2013, and you know he, he's finally made it, Tim, when he joins the Trading Justice podcast in 2015. So uh, we can just uh, we can just end it at there. I do want to shift topics real quick, though, T, and I want to talk about um, the Fed tomorrow. Um, you know, it's uh, you, you we're probably coming into one of the most important moments uh this year i want to say over the last seven years we've had a plethora of more important moments over the last seven years but i would say this year in the market this is probably the number one most expected uh day in the market and whether or not it uh, disappoints or not is going is another question but uh, i do expect a lot of movement what first of all i want you to talk to the listeners out there about why the fed is is so important and why there's so many headlines in the news right now pertaining to the Fed. Okay, you bet. You know, there's a couple of things that we always have to think about when we're trading. Number one is the chart. If you're new and you're out there and you're a new trader, new investor, focus on the chart. Uh, you know, interpreting all of the news, interpreting all of the information, leave that to mentors, leave that to, to people with more experience to help you understand that. That would be my advice. Now, pay attention for sure. Try to learn, try to grow, but don't get all worked up about it. Focus on the chart, focus on your system, focus on the rules. That aside, the Federal Reserve sets monetary policy. They control the money supply. They set the interest rates, and they are you know, directly integrated with the bond market now based on quantitative easing. We have never seen a Fed raise interest rates, Matt, not since we've started trading. You know, interest rates were already high, no. and they've no. been dropping. Uh, there's a great deal of Wall Street, people who've been trading 8, 10, 12. In fact, now i got to even think, when was the last time the Fed raised interest rates? Probably I think, 13, 14 I think years we've ago. had – no, I, I, I'm going to have to Google that, but I want to say we're going on year 9. So I think you and I were just barely starting uh, okay. starting our journey then. But I'll, I'll, I'll look it up while you talk. Yeah, definitely. And so here we are, and we're looking at a new marketplace that is not based on quantitative easing. See, when the Fed started lowering interest rates, they got it down to zero, basically. Zero to 0.25 is what the range they say is. And once they got it down there, they have not raised it in seven years. And so we're, what we've had is we've had a system that's based on them pushing money out into the market. A lot of the reason why we're at all-time highs is because of them pushing money out into the market so as we now move into a new market I think there's a lot of unknowns again they've also been talking about this for a long time see the Fed, Federal Reserve has a meeting every six weeks you know they don't necessarily um, <laughs> you know give us all the information but they've been saying they want to raise interest rates at the end of 2015 what now for two or three years Matt they've kind of had this yeah, they've plan been projecting in place. it 
since at least December of 2013, and I think it's actually should date back before then. Um, so, you know, the <laughs> the expectation was June or September, December 2015, but it, that plan in place has been around for a while. Yeah, sure has. And now here we are, but we're also now in a market that has had some flash crashes, some equity market risk. Uh, on August 25th, when you had the market crash coming out of the, that weekend that we've talked about so much, I don't know if the Federal Reserve wants to raise rates in this environment. And by the way, that's what traders are predicting. There is a, There are a lot of futures contracts and predictive tools over at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange that can give us a pretty accurate read on what traders expect from the market. And the last I saw, Matt, it's about 70-30. About 70% 70 of traders believe there will not be a rate hike. About 30 believe there will be. Uh, that's been oscillating that's back and forth. Just, I actually, I, I think yeah, it's I think reduced that's, even that's today. I think it's, yeah, I think it's about 2080 right. right now coming into the Fed. I don't think the market expects the Fed to do anything. I think, the, I think honestly, I think the traders on Wall Street – uh, at the Chicago board, everywhere around, around the world, are calling the Fed's bluff. Um, and it's going to be interesting to see what the Fed does. You know, just given the fact that they have told us the U.S. economy is strong enough to to withstand an interest rate hike. Um, we will see whether or not that's true or not. Uh, but they have said that. And if they're, if they're going to call the, you know, the market's going to call the Fed's bluff or not, that's going to be an interesting thing. Well, and here's the thing I want everybody out there to watch, if you can be in front of the market, is there's two things. Watch the burst and then watch the follow-through, okay? Right at 2 p.m. Eastern time, Matt, whether the Fed raises rates or not, you're going to see a flood of volume come into the market. And what Absolutely. that is, is that is institutions who have already decided what they want to do just clicking the computer alg algorithms on and hitting the market very, very hard. Now that's the burst. Watch the direction of the burst, the volatility of the burst. Watch what happens. And then the follow through is towards the close of the day. Okay. After about an hour, the algorithms have kind of settled in. Uh, the e, the you know, high frequency trading systems have kind of got done their job. They're still going to be running, but then you get manual institutional decision making to start coming in and it will tr drive and push the market towards the end of the day three o'clock eastern three thirty eastern i'm going to be watching the entire thing obviously and trading the entire thing but i think there's a lot to be learned here and it may set the stage you know really for the fourth quarter short-term volatility who knows but i think whatever we see the market do as a reaction to this could be a very important indicator and honestly it could kind of re reveal a little bit about what Wall Street thinks of the Fed right now yeah well I, I was reading a study and the last time they raised was uh, 2006 June of 2006 and um, so we've been trading just briefly we really haven't gotten active yet that much but in terms of 2006 the last three times of raised rates and they've only raised rates three times since 1994 so it's, it's, we're talking, you know, 21 years of data and they've only raised interest rates three times. Um, this would be the fourth time in 20 years that they've actually raised interest rates. It's not like the Fed has been, you know, hawkish very often. But uh, the prior three times in, from 94 to 2006, you basically, for the three months prior to the Fed announcement, all markets went up. Every sector went up. Okay, you had, you know, respectively between like 8 and 11 percent. However, this time, oh, oh, and by the way, coming out of the interest rate hike, all markets were down except like one sector, you know. Um, in that sector, I think it was the energy sector held a gain of about 2 percent. But outside of that, everything was down. Going into this interest rate hike, um, where's uh, the majority of the marketplace right now over the last three months? It's down. So we're already coming down, and, and I don't think we're coming down because the market's pricing in interest rates. That's ridiculous. The market's going down because of China and slowing growth in the, in the emerging markets. But we're already going down, and we're going into an interest rate hike. Let's say, hypothetically speaking, we do see that hike. Let's say we see that hike. Where do you expect the markets to go if we see the hike, given the fact that the prior data suggested that it goes down after a hike? 
and now we're already going down, going into a hike. So again, hypothetically, we're going into the hike. Well, over the course of uh, one or two days, who knows, but I honestly, I can't imagine that it would be good for stock prices. I think if and when the Fed does raise interest rates, it's probably not good for stock. I actually saw a, a poll from Wall Street, and before the market crashed last month, Matt, uh, the Wall Street was more concerned about the bond market reaction to a rate hike. But now they repulled those same hedge fund managers, institutional traders, that kind of thing. And it looks like Wall Street's much more concerned about stock prices based on a hike. Because of the tenuous nature of where we are, because of the flash crashes, because of what we've seen in prices probably the last month, two months. Uh, and also, like you said, even from the overseas risk from Greece and then China through the summertime. I think stock prices are at a real risky spot here now that doesn't mean i know exactly what's going to happen because nobody does nobody does um, yeah but i do think that there's risk there's more risk in stocks than i've seen in a long time and i think part of that and even going back to that august 25th date matt i don't think you have institutional damage like that and just recover right away a lot of this dead cat bounce, bounce back into old support. I mean, those are technical levels that we teach our traders to watch for. So it's going to be interesting. I'm excited. I'm going to react. You know, there, and this maybe would be the last bit of advice on this topic is, guys, trade what you see. Trade what happens. Get your watch list ready and rely on your systems. If you're flying around and it's like, you know, endorphins popping in your head like you're, like you're on a roller coaster, that's not a good sign. You need to go in and have your system set up so that oh. you know how you're going to approach it. You know, that really is the mark of a good trader. No, I agree with that 100%, Tim. I'm going to put you on no, the spot. Do there is not. This week. I don't think so. I'd be shocked. I wouldn't be shocked. I don't, I don't think so either. Because, but I, I don't I believe don't they so will. Either. No. We can't be shocked at anything the Fed does right now. <clears throat> but if you believe what they've said, they'll raise. If you think they're a bunch of lying pieces of shit, they won't. And since I think they're a bunch of lying pieces of dog shit, they won't. And that's my last thought. Tim, I want to <laughs> I want to switch topics a little bit as well. I had to put it in there. I'm sorry. I, I could have went off for a, a, a very long time on the topic. So I got to tell you a quick story. I'll make morning. it as fast as I can. I know we I know you got to catch an airplane and we do want to talk about the NFL. But I was doing a I was doing a presentation in front of a, a group of students, new students. They're really cool people. I met a lot of good people down in Phoenix over the weekend. And I was doing a piece on the economy and the Federal Reserve. And I was laying down some truth. You know, Matt, you know how I do. Uh, you, you know my presentation on that. Yeah. And it was kind of one of those tough ones to take, you know, when you, when you have to hear about how Things aren't necessarily where you want them to be, and you have to make some changes in your life. That can be rough. And at the very end of the presentation, I was also feeling like, oh, we got to get to lunch. These guys are hungry. I'm going a little bit long. And so I say, and, and guys, if you don't take action, that's you choosing ignorance. Now, come on in. We want to have a yell. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> I've, I've done things like that. All right, now come on in here. Let's yell greed. Come on. <laughs> let's go yell money. Come on. Let's do this. Um, no, I've done <laughs> I've added statements like that. I've been like, all right, hands in the middle, everybody. Come on. Um, no, it's awesome, dude. That's awesome. All right, Tim. We got, uh, we got 10 minutes. Let's get into our NFL picks. Uh, every year we put them out there for public usage, and just to remind right. everybody, uh, Tim did pick the Baltimore Ravens to both win the divisions, the North Division last year, and take the wild card. I just wanted everybody Stop. to be reminded of Stop. the Ravens going to the playoffs twice last year. That's how much Tim liked the Baltimore Ravens. So we're going to start with that division since it is infamous here on the Trading Justice Podcast. T. Where do you see? We got the Bengals, the Steelers, the Ravens, and the Browns. Okay, who's going to win the division? Number one. I hate to say it, but I'm going to say oh, Cincinnati. Lord. I can't take it. I I, I can't. I, it, it, he bothers me too much to support this pick. <laughs> I cannot see Aaron. Be yeah, happy about I know. This. 
We have a friend who's a Bengals fan, and he's the yeah, he's about the most annoying um, human being on the planet I mean, sometimes, sometimes, especially when it comes to NFL. I do love him. He's taking yeah, me to lunch today. So, uh, but anyway, okay. so okay, you got, you got right. the, I, I, I got, got the Bengals. Bengals. Who you got? Um, I'm gonna go Ravens. I love their I love their defense. I know Sucks went out week one, um, uh, but uh, I do I do like their running game. I like their offensive line. I like John Harbaugh. I'm gonna go with the Ravens. I, I got questions. Got the Browns it. are terrible. <laughs> terrible the Steelers have defensive problems and the Bengals are good they're going to give them a run for it but I'm going to go with the Ravens all right next one we're going to go with the AFC South Titans Texans Colts and the Jags Titans looking good in week one where are you going T well Mariota did look really really good and by the way this is how bad I am at picking NFL games I I'm in a lock pool and you You know who I took for week one lock Matt oh you took Tampa Tampa? Bay you took a rookie quarterback no I picked it in week one. Well, I figured yeah, a rookie on the road for the first a... time against oh, Lovey Smith's he, defense. He's not even the coach of the Bears any longer. Why are you such a homer? Oh, and he's, he wasn't even that good. I know. Oh my <laughs> god, this is terrible. They got lit up by like you had. You got kicked bad. out in the it's lock really of the bad. of the. All right, oh wow, so. that's. Awesome. Good work. Team. Yeah, because I wanted to take New England, but I got my pick in Good late. Work. I know. I, I'm bad. So anyway, I, I'm gonna on the AFC South. I'm gonna take Indy. I know they got beat Week One, but I do like Andrew Luck. Oh, I, I, you, you got like and, Andrew uh, Luck, and let's face it, the uh, the, the Bills look good. You know. Um, so mm-hmm. <coughs> I'm gonna go with the Colts as well. Let's go with the AFC West. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm a little under the weather here. Sorry that you're sick. Oh, it's been. Yeah, a week I know you've now, been man. sick. It's been a week, but uh, AFC yeah. West: Chiefs, Broncos, yeah. Chargers, Oakland Raiders. Are you going? Uh, you gonna go? You gonna go upset here? You gonna go chalk? What are you doing here? Well, I don't know what you think chalk is, but I'm gonna go with the Chiefs. I uh, do not believe in Peyton Manning's 80-year-old arm or neck, and I think Denver's really lost some talent there. Quite frankly, I think that I'm gonna go with the Kansas City Chiefs. Chiefs look good. Jamal Charles looks good. Jeremy Macklin, great signing. Their defense is solid. I love uh, Phillip Rivers and what they're doing on offense. Eric Weddle is one of my favorite players for the Chargers. Um, but I just, you know, and this is not a Peyton Manning pick because I agree. He's, his arm looks almost gone. And their offensive line is in shambles starting two or three rookies. But that defense is sick. That defense is nasty. And uh, mm. because of the defense, I am going to go with the Denver Broncos. Next, okay. next we have the AFC East. Where are you going with the East? Make it, Jets, Patriots, make it Bills, Super Dolphins. I got to take the Super Bowl champs uh, with Tom Brady back on the field. Bill Belichick, one of the greatest coaches of any sport at all time. Of all time, I am Jeez, not a hater. Lot. I believe in greatness. I believe in greatness, Matt. I and when greatness. I see greatness, yep. I, I like it, so I got to go with the Patriots. I know that you can't, Listen, but I, I, I can't. But I will say this: I went with the Patriots last year. I had the mm-hmm. Dolphins to get the wild card, um, but uh, I, I I cannot stand Bill Belichick. He is a flat out cheater. I can't stand him. I can't stand how he didn't stand up for Tom Brady. Um, you know, I'm so happy Tom Brady was freed. Roger Goodell should be fired. I. Uh, and uh, I cannot stand the Patriots, but you know what? You got to respect greatness. And Tom Brady is great. He's one of the top three quarterbacks of all time. You can make an argument for number one. Um, love how he went up against Goodell. Love how he, uh, you know, the players' union supported him. However, I'm not going the Patriots. I love what Miami is doing this year. And uh, it's Miami's year this year. The Dolphins are going to take it with a 10 and 6 record. But that division is nasty. The Bills look good. The Jets' defense looks good. The Patriots are, let's face it, the Patriots. And the Dolphins look a lot better. I just think Tannehill is going to step up, uh, going to have a great uh, fourth year in, in, in the league. And I think their defense is going to come uh, come together by the end. And uh, so I'm going to go with the Miami Dolphins. Taking that the division's division. okay. What well, the whole league is now. That division is the be best. Honest. Well, it's it not. is, but that you division say that is so that when the Dolphins in... lose, that you don't have to take it. That division you, is. is you tell me another it. better division. Okay, uh, week one. All right. Every team in the AFC East is one and all. Every team won, basically handled their games. I okay? still there, believe there's... the NFC West is better. Um, first of all. I think Arizona, I mean, they won 12 games last year, 11 games or whatever it was, didn't even make the, the playoffs because of it. Uh, Seattle is awesome. 
San Francisco looks to be improved, and St. Louis, I think, is a real strong team as well. I St. Louis don't defense think is very good. Out. I mean, we could do that. We could have that discussion another time. I think the AFC East yeah. is good, but let's not call Rex Ryan, you know, like Vince Lombardi here because he won one this, game at home in, in an sexy, open. Let's not do it. Sexy and the Rex Jets team. stink. The Jets stink. Sex, I don't sex, care what anybody Jets, says. Listen, their the defense Dolphins is good. are decent. The Dolphins are the good. AFC, what are you talking about? The AFC is just right. solid. Every defense in that division is going to be a top give me 10 Give two defense. wild card teams. Give me two wild card uh, teams from the New AFC. New England. New England. And I'm right. going to go with uh, I'm going to go with Kansas City. New England and Kansas City. Okay, so you're going to take – got it. Well, you know, thinking right. about right. it, I, I got to pick two going? wild card teams. I'm going to go – I'm going to take an AFC North team, and I am going to take – Pittsburgh. Yeah. And I am going to take an AFC West team, and I will take Denver. I don't think Peyton's going to lose a bunch of games. So, all right. Oh, so we've got it. Hey, has got NFC, Cincy, Indy, Case, Kansas City, Pats, Pittsburgh, Denver. You've got Baltimore, Indy, Denver, Miami, New England, and Kansas City. All right, NFC, let's start with the North. Go, you, you, you first on the NFC. Me first on the NFC. Um, I think the Packers are the best team in the league, and uh, they're probably going to be my Super Bowl pick, not to shock anybody there. Uh, but uh, I'm going to go with the Packers. Packers can't stop anybody. I'll tell you what, if they can't even stop Chicago Bears from moving the ball, they're going to have trouble all year long. I'm taking they Detroit, with the Bears. which is Detroit. blasphemy. Yep. They gave up a 21-point lead in the second half I'm to, not to the – Detroit, by the way. Of course I'm taking no. Chicago. I'm taking the Bears. I'm going to give the homer okay. pick. If I can't root for my own team, I've got problems in the NFL. Yes. So I'm taking Chicago. The Bears are going to be lucky to win five games. They hey, will keep be it, lucky. Keep it nice. I, I, keep it Phil, nice. put All that right. down. Five, six games, top shelf. That's, that's about the level of talent the Chicago Bears have. All right. Uh, nice. Next uh, – Let's go with the NFC East, Cowboys, Giants, Eagles, and Redskins. Cowboys yep. losing Des Bryant. Big. Yeah, that's rough. Got the Jones fracture. Yeah. Average time is about 8 to 12 weeks recovery. He might miss the entire year, T. Who are you going with? I'm going with the Eagles. I, uh, I just believe, I don't know why, don't tell me. I think any team that's smart enough to cut Tim Tebow probably has a pretty good roster. Um, yeah, I like so. it. Give me the. You know give me how the I know Eagles. you're a bad person. You know how I know you're a bad person. You hate Tim <laughs> Tebow. Nobody should hate Tim Tebow. He's an upstanding <laughs> citizen of the United States. He's a good American. Right, can, I he, rant real quick. This whole control. this whole garbage <laughs> about how white men in America can't love Jesus. Are you kidding me, white men in America? I'm a about? white man in America. I what I'm tired of like, about reading on social America media not loving Jesus. Yeah. What I'm Who saying said is, white I men see in America a, can't. No, no, no. <laughs> That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. No, you, white you, men you, in America you're not seeing Jesus? this then. You're not seeing this then. All of these guys believe that Tim Tebow is discriminated against because he's white and loves Jesus. And because he loves that, Jesus, man, that's why they – yeah, they, they say it all, all the time. I see I'm it all the it, time. I, I'm going to say it right now. I'm going to say this right now. If, if, Tim Tebow is blackballed from the NFL not because he loves Jesus, okay? It's because the crazy people who follow Tim Tebow – are nut jobs who who cause a stir and NFL coaches hate distractions. It's not Tim Tebow. Well, Tim Tebow goes well, in there and works that. his ass off and he just Here's, he has more heart than anybody in the NFL and he has the talent to be in the NFL and he played great in the preseason and he's a hell of a player and I still remember watching him at the Florida Gators. I'd love Tim Tebow. I cannot stand Fine. the nut love jobs. Things about who, him too. But he's a okay. borderline talent regardless. He probably is good enough to – yes, he is a borderline he talent. Like, he had like 50 touchdowns his senior year, won the Heisman Trophy twice. The, guy, the guy's a talent. stud. Yeah. Well, okay. Listen. Blasphemy. <laughs> Blasphemy. You're going to hell. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Next pick. Oh, Next. oh I haven't done mine. I haven't done mine. Yes. You went with the Eagles. Um, Eagles. I, 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 the, the Eagles, 
they're they're solid. They're solid. I'm gonna go with the Cowboys. Um, I I I just think Tony Romo. I I, I really like Tony Romo. I like that offensive line. And I think their defense is better than people give them credit for. So I am going the Cowboys right. on that. Let's go with the All NFC. Right. Uh, the NFC South. I go first on this one. Um, and we got the Falcons, Panthers, Saints, and the Bucks. Uh, you can count out the Saints this year, in my estimation. The Bucks might only win two games. Uh, they're probably in the running for the first pick in the NFL draft, although they do have some competition in the Chicago Bears. Um, I am going to go with the Atlanta Falcons. Give me Carolina and Cam Newton in that defense. They lost their best offensive receiver this year. But I, I would love like to defense. know what the difference between Cam Newton and Tim Tebow is. Um, don't get me started, dude. I would, you know what the, the you know what the difference is is that he can actually Cam Newton can throw a spiral, Matt. And I'm not even trying to make that up. You've seen Tim Tebow throw. Tim he Tebow can't throw the ball. He does. He's, he's throwing the ball a lot better. Okay, we can stop Cam this Newton right now. Throw it on okay. Lasers. Yeah. okay, you got the Panthers. I got the Falcons. And finally, we got the NFC West. We have the Rams, Cardinals, 49ers, Seahawks. Stack division, although I don't think the 49ers as, are as good as, as they looked in week one. Um, I think the Minnesota Vikings aren't that good, to be honest with you. So we, uh, I'm going to go with I'm gonna go with the Hawks. I think you got to go chalk there. I know they lost week one. I, I think they're going to bring back gold uh, cam chancellor they need to they're idiots if they don't um so i'm gonna go with uh the uh, seahawks hawks are full of talent and i don't have a problem with that i get it i'm gonna go with the cardinals i love what bruce arians is doing down there in the desert and i think that uh as long as carson carson palmer's got to stay healthy i know that's a tough one to call because he rarely rarely does but I'm going to go with the Cardinals to win that division. Now, let's also pick some wild card picks here, Matt. I'm thinking I'll go ahead and throw mine out there first. I've got uh -huh. out of the NFC because I'm going Chicago, Carolina, Arizona, and Philly. I'm going to toss in Green Bay and yep. Seattle. I'm going to toss in the Cowboys just because I want to do it you know, uh, in honor of you picking the Ravens twice. Um, uh, no kidding. I'm going to go with the St. Louis Rams coming out of the West. Um, I love their defense, love their defense. And yeah, I'm going to go my football. second pick. Oh yeah. Oh, by, by far. And I'm going to go with the, uh, Eagles, Philadelphia Eagles coming out of the NFC East. Fly, that is our picks Eagles, for the NFL. Fly. There you go. That is our Super picks Bowl, for man. the NFL. We'll do a, a half uh, at the halftime. We'll Super do kind of recap where we're at. Let's go Super Bowl picks here. Um, my Super Bowl pick in the NFC is going to be the Green Bay Packers to represent the NFC. And I am going to go with the <sighs> – this is hard for me. I'm going to go with Miami Dolphins to represent the NFC in the Super Bowl. Oh, my gosh. Okay, First the... time. 30 years. <laughs> First time Maybe in 30 they'll pick years. up Tim Tebow and bench that bum I, they've got uh, quarterback right now. Um, listen, I would support it. Tough, 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 tough. I'm going to start with my NFC pick. And my NFC pick is going to be the Arizona Cardinals. Arizona? I don't even have them in the playoffs. Yep. My All NFC right. pick is going to be the Indianapolis Colts. Indy, Colts, Arizona, and who's going to win the Super Bowl for you? Uh, Andrew Luck starts his dynasty reign of greatness. The bearded one, I believe. I can't support that. Yeah. I can't support that. I am going to go with the Packers for the second year in a row. I just think they Aaron Rodgers is the best quarterback in the game. They have the best offense in the game. I know they lost Jordy Nelson. James Jones more than picked up the slack, and uh, I'm going to go with the Packers. There, I had to do it. <laughs> you had to drop James I had, Jones. You I had to do it. You can't even help yourself, honestly. <laughs> I, I had to do it. Out of the last 24 games he's played with Aaron Rodgers, he's caught 20 touchdowns. Stop it. That's Stop not it. a small this sample size. In touchdowns. statistics, this is called confirmation bias, Matt. Okay? It, it, whatever, whatever, but it's not a small sample size. 
This is 20 touchdowns over 24 games. He caught two touchdowns in week in week one, and he's going to catch the game-winning touchdown in Super Bowl 50 for the Packers against whoever I picked, the Dolphins, and that saddens me to say that, but it has to happen. It has to happen, so Aaron Arrington can never talk again. I will. I will give everybody out there a challenge. I'm gonna, Matt. I'm gonna make a challenge for NFL fans out there. Some of you guys don't listen, don't watch football. I get it. Some of you watch a lot of football. If you are a football addict and you start at 9 a.m. and you end at 10 p.m. because you watch every game morning, afternoon, and night, my challenge is try to cut that back for three hours on the weekend and That's do right, your baby. trading research. Okay. Football is great in moderation. You know, uh, all all things are great in moderation. So make sure that um, you know you're getting your job done as well. It's good to have a hobby. It's good to have something that you can do to unwind and relax. But uh, remember, we're building businesses here as well. So anyway, good just wanted to throw that in, Matt. You've been listening yeah. to the Trading Justice Podcast, guys. Right, we'll, we'll see you guys. next time. You've been listening to the Trading Justice Podcast. If you've enjoyed yourself and think that the conversations and topics we've covered are important, help spread the word. Give us your feedback. Five stars on iTunes, like us on Facebook, and follow us on Twitter. The Trading Justice Podcast is proudly sponsored by TackleTrading.com. Get off the sidelines and get in the game.